Hi Elvis fans, Tom Brown here with another edition of Gates of Graceland. And uh, if you can tell from over my shoulders, um, yes, I'm sitting in the living room inside Graceland Mansion here in Memphis, Tennessee at the top of the hill off Elvis Presley Boulevard. And I'm joined by a couple of gentlemen who, uh, this is not their first time in this, in this mansion, in this house. Uh, a, a couple of people that uh, Colonel Parker relied heavily on, and uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about Colonel. First, we'll talk about where we are. We're Charles Stone, welcome. Yes. Good thank to see you, you again. Thank, thank you, Greg Tom. McDonald. Good to see you. Greg, nice thank you for you. being here. Thank you for having me. Here we sit in the living room at Graceland, and I know you guys walked in just a few minutes ago. What are your, your thoughts? It's it's quiet here in the house. We're after tours. And uh, must it probably was never this quiet when you were here, when Elvis was oh, around. no, but I mean, how cool is this? It doesn't get any cooler than this anywhere in the world. Yeah. But you mentioned about the last time I was here, it was after the show we did in Memphis. I think we did three or four shows that weekend. But after the last show, Elvis threw a party for the band. And it was raining hard, I mean, pouring rain. So we had the bus. Elvis came on home you know, immediately after the show. We went to the hotel and changed and came afterwards. And from the bus to the door, it was dirt, wet, muddy. And we went in here and went straight back through here over the white shag carpet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and then there was a room to the left that had all his gold records. That's where the party was. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at everybody's trying to wipe their feet. And God, as Garcia said, don't worry about it. He won't have it cleaned. He'll just replace it. <laughs> That's probably true. Uh, yeah, probably so. <laughs> and looking at it, he did because it was shag carpet at that time. Yeah, it's an amazing space. I mean, uh, Greg, for you coming back in, what are your thoughts? Being well, it's just, it just, it, it's hard to believe it's been so many years ago. Charles and I were just talking. We've known each other almost fifty years, and this is where it wow. started. I met Charles and Palm Springs at the Colonel's house, and then over the years, I'd come here as a young kid with with the colonel. Yeah. And when the colonel showed up, I think it had a different atmosphere oh, than when sure. <laughs> the guys were here alone. When the colonel came it got sort of formal and yeah. And you know, we were we were sort of from the other side of the planet. Yeah. And uh, I think there was I didn't I didn't see all of the uh, the fun that was probably had when we weren't here. Right, right. Greg, tell me about yourself. Tell tell the fans out there, you know, how did how did you enter the Elvis world? Um uh, I'm a, I'm a nine ten year old kid, and I'm my dad's a preacher, and and we used to work with a, a minister named Oral Roberts. We had a circus tent. Oral Roberts had a circus tent that had ten thousand seats, so I would pass the velvet bag and pick up the collections, and all the kids would have to set the chairs, the ten thousand chairs, and then Brother Roberts would do his. I'm in Palm Springs. I'm nine. 10 years old and I'm changing filters on air conditioners. I was sent up into this nice neighborhood called Las Palmas and I was just in a hall closet changing filters. That's all I could do. I was just a kid and I'm up underneath the furnace and my feet are sticking out in the hall <laughs> and I'm, I'm got a hip joint toolbox there in the hall and I'm trying to pick up a screwdriver and there's this little white poodle dog and he's trying to eat me up. He's barking, and I'm cursing. And I look down between my feet, and there's a guy talking to me. And it's, I can tell, it's Elvis's face. I mean, everybody knew Elvis. And he said, boy, come out from under there. He's laughing at me. He says, what are you doing under there? I, and I crawled out, and I said, well, I'm trying to change your filters, and your dog's trying to eat me up. And he said, oh, that's not my dog. It belongs to that girl out here by the pool. So... Uh, we start talking. He says, what are you doing? You're an air conditioning man. I said, no, I just, I can just change filters. And, and I, but I work for Oral Roberts when we're not in Palm Springs. I work for, I'm one of the preacher kids and we all work for the, for the church. And he says, well, I love Oral Roberts. He says, you're an assembly of God boy. And I said, yeah, I guess I am. And he says, I'm an assembly of God guy and your dad's a preacher. So we immediately break off into all the preachers he likes, and he likes gospel music, and I'm mm -hmm. just a kid. So the phone rings, and he answers the phone, and this guy, it's this guy, the Colonel. I don't know who Colonel Parker is, I know who Elvis was. And he said, this is the Colonel, he's my manager. He lives over here a couple blocks away, and I'm on my bike. <laughs> he says, you, you go over, and he wants you to change his filters. He tells me where he lives. <laughs> So I go over on the bike, and I, I'm, I think the colonel is like this military guy. He's mm -hmm. a colonel. Well, I show up, and there's this regular guy, and I come in, 
and we talked for a few hours. I changed, <laughs> I changed the filter, and I stayed and worked with him for 27 years. Wow, yeah. wow. But but it, but it all starts with Elvis. The, the white dog and and Elvis yep. at that house. But Colonel could read people though, couldn't he? I mean, even at that age, he was figuring out the kind of person that you were. And, oh, you know, a, a, but you were, you know, I'm looking at a kid, 19, this is a go-getter. This is a kid that's, that's out there doing it. And Charles, tell us where you entered the story. Where, where, did, where did you meet Colonel and how did you get involved in this, this whole Elvis uh, world? To make a uh, long story short, uh, they sent me to Alabama to put a show on sale because it was a do-it-yourselfer venue. There was, no, there was no computers, no box office staff. <laughs> yeah. I had to hire bank tellers. And I had been in this building with Chicago and grandfather and bands like that. So I put it on sale, and I had a phone number to call when I sold out. Mm -hmm. It took six, eight hours to sell out because it's, you know, one ticket at a time. Yeah. And so I called this number, and somebody answers. I didn't know who it was. I said, I speak to Jerry Weintraub or Tom Hewlett. Who's calling? I said, Charles Tom. Well, this is a colonel I just locked up. I never expected to be talking to Colonel Parker because he was as famous as Elvis yeah. in, in the entertainment industry. Sure. And I just locked up. He said... Are you in the box office? I said, yes, sir. I immediately started calling him sir out of the respect that mm -hmm. you know, he gets. And he said, Are you, I want you to open every drawer and look, at, look and see if there's any tickets left. I said, Colonel, I've balanced my money against the manifest. Mr. Stone got my attention real quick. <laughs> he, I said, yes, sir. So I put the phone down and opened and shut the same drawer six times. No, sir, there are no tickets left. You've done a great job coming to California tonight. I said, well, I was supposed to go back with the Sinatra show. He said, just a moment. So Jerry Weintraub gets on the phone and says, come on out to California. I'll send somebody else. So I fly to California. And the next day, I sit in the office at MGM Studio all day, and nobody talks to me. All day I'm there. Nobody, at least they brought me a ham sandwich for lunch. <laughs> that night, we go to Trader Vic's and have the dinner that I've told about where the colonel did not order anything. And I'm thinking, am I really witnessing what I'm thinking? And the next day, they take me into Colonel's office and we start booking tours. And I think what you ask about Greg and the Colonel's people, he knows who he can trust. Mm -hmm. One thing about the Colonel's entourage, everybody in there could be totally trusted. And, and the Colonel just knew. He just yeah. knew who, who he could trust and do things with. So for the Elvis fans that are watching this Gates episode, what's the biggest misconception as, as guys who worked for Colonel, What's the biggest misconception that, that Elvis fans have about the kind of guy he was, the kind of businessman he was, and the relationship that he had with Elvis? I'll, I'll start that and then let Greg get in. But in, in Lake Tahoe one day, he gets a call from NBC Studio, NBC TV, mm -hmm. and they said they had a cancellation at prime time that, next week and they needed to run an Elvis movie. What can a deal we make? So whatever deal the Colonel made with them, the studios when he made the movies, he negotiated that morning $750,000, one run that week and one rerun. So before Elvis ever woke up, he made three quarters of a million dollars <laughs> for something that he did 10 to 15 years ago. And something that he did 10 to 15 years ago that somehow in the negotiation of making that film, Colonel had the rights, they had to get that clear. Yeah, I was so puzzled as to why that they didn't call whatever the movie, I don't remember yeah. the movie it was, but the Colonel and I said, damn. That's a hell of a deal right there that he made. Yeah. So uh, he took good care of Elvis. Colonel was the kind of person that, and, and you hear the, about this in business a lot, and, and Charles and I were talking earlier, you know, Ted Turner's one of those kind of people. They underestimate a Southerner. They underestimate mm -hmm. the intelligence. And usually that works to the advantage of Colonel or, or a Ted Turner. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he, he played the part of, go ahead, and, go ahead and underestimate me. Yeah. That's fine. Treat me like a country boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For you, talking to the fans and, and what you know the fans know about Colonel and what you know, what, what's something you see that, that they don't understand or, or, or realize? The Colonel's life was dedicated to Elvis. He loved him. Colonel had breakfast meetings at 6.15 every morning. You couldn't be late for the breakfast meeting or you got the bad jobs all day. Mm -hmm. you, Charles knows you'd be in trouble if you missed the breakfast meeting on the road. I never or, missed one because I didn't want to be in, miss be in one. The, uh, or if you weren't carrying, <laughs> if you weren't carrying your Snowman's League card too, you got a fine and you were in trouble. I still carry my Snowman's card today. <laughs> tell, tell them what that is. Tell them what the Snowman's, Snowman's League of America. There's an entertainment business uh, club called the Showman's League of America, which is the International Association of Fairs and Exhibitors. 
and the colonel was always on the board of that, and it's, it was all the, the bookers and the fair guys. Well, the colonel created the, the Snowman's League, and the, and, the, and the logo was let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. So uh, it was really just a club of friends, and the presidents were involved in it. Elvis was the first member and the colonel, and that was, that was always a, a fun thing. It didn't mean anything. What mm -hmm. it meant was you, you can't lie to them, but you can snow them for their own good. Mm -hmm. That was one of his sayings. But he spent his time every day working on Elvis. Like Charlie said many times, we were around when he took a pass on the Beatles. He didn't wow. take the Beatles at their, in their yeah. prime when Brian Epstein died. The colonel told those guys directly, and there's somewhere here uh, an email back and forth. To it's a telegram. Telegram, <laughs> but not an email. That was email before <laughs> yeah. email. Yeah. 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 And I was once out at Frank Sinatra's compound with the colonel and, and a famous banker named Al Hart from City National Bank was there and we, he wanted the colonel to go with him to talk to Sinatra. And Sinatra had been, uh, had been retired for a while and he had a health problem and he just didn't tell the public but when he recovered from that health problem, uh, Al Hart had to go tell uh, Sinatra had to go back to work because he was really short of money. But he wanted the colonel to tell him. He was afraid of it. <laughs> so colonel went out and, and we were in, out in Rancho Mirage on Frank Sinatra Boulevard. We sat out by the pool and the colonel says, Al here says you got to go back to work, Frank. <laughs> you got to go back to work. You're, you're, you're out of money. And Sinatra said, well, I'm feeling better. And so the colonel arranged for Jerry Weintraub to do an event in New York at Madison Square Garden. It right. was called the main event, and that was his comeback. And Sinatra at that meeting says, Colonel, all this stuff is making me crazy. I hate this business. He says, you got to manage me now. It's been long enough. And the colonel says, I, I can't. I only manage Elvis. He and I are partners. I only manage Elvis. So uh, that was the second giant group. I mean, Sinatra and then, mm -hmm. of course, the Beatles. I heard him pass on them. Unbelievable because they were huge. Yeah. Right at that moment, Sinatra was making his comeback. Sinatra's, you know, that kind of entertainer that that understands the importance of a, of, a, of of having that buffer. You know, yeah. you want the artist, you want the artist to stay doing what they do best, and you need, and and, and this is where a lot of times where I think Colonel gets a lot of the blame. You had to have someone to say no. You had to have, to, you know, to studios, to business. You had to have, you had to have a bad guy to take care of that business, to keep that away from, from the artist. That's a really important part of being Somebody has to wear the black hat. Yeah. And with Elvis, he would rather make no decision than a bad decision, which I'm sure you've heard that mm -hmm. before. So therefore, he had the Colonel make all his decisions for him. Uh, one of the uh, things that Colonel gets blamed for a lot is that he wouldn't let him make a serious role in a movie, a dramatic role or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, one evening, Colonel and I went to have dinner with uh, uh, Hal Wallace. So as we're having dinner, I didn't, I'm a kid and you know, I got a big mouth sometimes. And I just asked him, I said, Mr. Wallace, I can ask you something. I can see Colonel tense up over there. But I said, if the rumor has it that uh, you, know, all wouldn't, you wouldn't let, or Colonel wouldn't let Elvis do a dramatic role. He said, that's not true, Charlie. He said, I can tell you, there's not a studio in the world that would have financed a movie that he didn't sing in. He said, I'm just telling you flat out, it wouldn't, it couldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. He said, why would you take the greatest singer in the world and put him in a movie and not let him sing? Yeah. Makes little sense that way. Yeah. And if you look at the numbers, you look at the box office numbers, those movies he made coming out of the Army, um, you know, he makes the four movies before the Army, which are, you know, Loving You and Love Me mm -hmm. Tender and Jailhouse Rock and King Creole. And then he goes to the Army and then he comes back from the Army. And what do you do when you come back? You make GI Blues because that's you know right. it's a war you know singing war guy you, you got to do that one. But then those those couple he make right after that Flaming Star and Wild in the Country those are dramatic those are more dramatic mm -hmm. films with less music, mm -hmm. and those are not successful. And again, just look at exactly. the box office numbers, and then the next movie Blue Hawaii, mm -hmm. boom! Mm -hmm. Now the die is cast, and you just keep looking at those numbers. If anything, Elvis's film career was a victim of us. Because we're the ones that went to those movies. We're the ones that right. bought those soundtracks. And the ones that didn't go to the movies, too. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's an interesting story. And I think, like I said, Colonel is one of those, those characters that swirl around in the world of Elvis that are, are loved and, and also uh, blamed. And it just, it just 
is a is a giant uh, fog uh, around you know what really happened and to have people that were there uh, I think is really important to hear it from you for the Elvis fans to hear it from you guys and I know walking back in this mansion to today what was it that you was who was it told you that you would never come back in this house again Colonel Colonel Colonel, Colonel. <laughs> you know it was it was uh, issues after Elvis passed yeah. Colonel and I'd sit in the backyard. Most of Elvis Presley's business was done in the backyard of his house on Vista Vespero, not in Hollywood, or in the steam room at the Spa Hotel in Palm Springs, most of the deals. I would sit and hear hundreds of phone calls between Elvis and the Colonel. I'd only hear the Colonel's side of it. And uh, a lot of the movie things. Uh, Elvis did want to make other movies. I know, you know, he wanted to go back on the road too for those nine years when the Beatles were out and the Colonel wouldn't let him play. All of the other music stars from the 50s got reduced down to nightclubs. Flats yeah, Domino, yeah. Everly Brothers, uh, Chuck Berry, Jerry Lee Lewis. All those guys were now playing nightclubs and Elvis was a movie star in Hollywood. So if you notice, it was just a couple of weeks after the Beatles did their press conference and they broke up, that Elvis and the Colonel started announcing the comeback special. Mm -hmm. The Colonel knew that there was the 1968 comeback special was a crucial time for Elvis because the Beatles had just wiped all the American acts out. So that special had to be really good. Well, his version of the special was it was going to be a Christmas show. Right. And I heard him selling it to Singer Sewing Machines actually financed that show. So the Colonel, to make sure Elvis had was successful coming back, he had them, the Singer Sewing Machine Company bought 500,000 pieces of the single to be sold exclusively mm -hmm. for an exclusive window at Singer Sewing Machine Companies. You couldn't get it anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So it was it was destined to be a Christmas special and there was a little rub between the Colonel and Steve Bender. So as soon as that show ran on NBC, Elvis's comeback show, Elvis had a, a gold single. Well, two weeks later, the deal was that he had to buy another 500,000 pieces, registered, you know, in those days. Mm -hmm. And then had a platinum album. In three weeks, Elvis Presley had a platinum album and everybody stopped calling it the Singer Special. And they now call right. it all these years later, the Comeback Special. Right. It doesn't because the Colonel made it a comeback. Yeah. He didn't know for sure. He wouldn't, he wouldn't let Elvis take that chance. Yeah. No way. There's a part of, of showbiz today that I really want to get your input in. Colonel was really smart in, in how Elvis you know, Elvis didn't do game shows, he didn't do talk shows, he didn't, you know, you never, you, you paid to see Elvis on screen, and then he would go away, and then you would miss him, and you'd want to see him again. In today's showbiz, in the day of Twitter, and Facebook, and Instagram, and all this social media, where celebrities have instant access to their fans, and can share every bit of their private life, and public life, at all times, what, what, what do you think Colonel would have made of all, of all this? Personally, I don't think it would have changed any way he did it. I think he would still remain mm -hmm. the unknown X, the unknown factor with Elvis, because mm -hmm. that's what sold. Mm -hmm. That's what sold is you don't really know anything about Elvis until you pay to go see him. Yeah. There isn't anything else. There's no big uh, Rolling Stone article on him. There's no TV uh, entertainment tonight on him. He didn't right, do that. Right. If you want to see Elvis, you had to go pay. It's the things we know about the inner workings of Elvis's world are really things we learned after Elvis passed. Mm -hmm. it, that we didn't really know anything about. You know, growing up in Tupelo, I'd come by this front gate and you'd see cars up here. Maybe Elvis was home, but you didn't know. You just you didn't know the day to day. So I've always been interested in in, in how smart Colonel was in, in making sure that there was just enough Elvis out there. To, to keep people hungry for exactly. it. Exactly. And Colonel was in that world where those guys were all still alive that had handled Gregory Peck and the big movie stars from the MGM days. And he was he was around a lot of the old timers that had made movies and they never let the stars out walk into a coffee shop. And Elvis was really caught up into that early part of it. It wasn't all his idea. He was probably way more willing to go out and hang around in the streets and go to the clubs than but they, they wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Got him Harry Jenkins, a couple of guys. They, were, they, they gave advice like they were talking to a Gary Cooper. Right. Stay out of the public. Make them buy your tickets. 
guys, I want to thank you so much for being here with us on Gates thank of Graceland. You, and and no you. better place to have a conversation about the life and career of Elvis Presley than, than right here inside yeah, of Graceland. His living room. And, and thank you for coming right. back here and sharing your thoughts on, on Elvis and, and Colonel Parker. And uh, I know all of us uh, appreciate the time that you spent, those amazing years that you spent on the road, uh, you know, out there every night, you know, venue after venue. <clears> we really appreciate it for all that you did. Everybody, I'm Tom Brown. Thanks for joining us here on Gates of Grayson. We'll be back soon with another exciting edition. Right now, we're going to head off to Palm Springs on the jet. What about it? Huh? Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. All right.